is Mark Goodman. I'm a professor at Kent State and I chair in scholastic journalism. Um, I, I come to this issue with uh, uh, over 25 years now working with high school and college journalists at all levels and, and hearing firsthand the struggles that they face, the students, their teachers, the people who are trying to prepare the next generation of journalists. We've got an great panel today to talk about some of those challenges and unfortunately we have a very short amount of time um, for these people to, to tell you their really compelling story so we'll try to make it um, uh, as, as concise as we possibly can. I'm just going to introduce the panelists by name. Um, their full bios are in your program and I would encourage you to take a look at them. Um, actually I'm going to introduce them when I, um, they, they're ready to speak so we won't spend the time doing that now. Well, you know, what prompted this panel in the first place is the realization, well, the, the very uh, well-marked um, anniversary of one of the most important Supreme Court decisions um, involving students' rights uh, of, of the, the history of this country. And that um, is a case called Hazelwood School District versus Colmeyer. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. But did, before we get to uh, the Hazelwood case, we have to understand where the law um, began or where it stood before the Hazelwood ruling in 1988. In 1969, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a decision in a case called Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District that involved the rights of middle and high school students to wear black armbands voicing their concern about the U.S. war in Vietnam. The Des Moines, Iowa School District punished those students, suspended them, and those students contested that. And in 1969, the Supreme Court majority ruled that neither students nor teachers shed their free expression rights at the schoolhouse gate. What the Supreme Court in the Tinker decision did was say that only when school officials can show that student speech is going to create some kind of material and substantial disruption of school activities um, or an invasion of the rights of other students would their censorship be permitted. Um, the Supreme Court explicitly said the undifferentiated fear that always accompanies the expression of an unpopular viewpoint is not a sufficient justification for censorship. In essence, the Supreme Court said the price we pay for living in a free society is by allowing students, even in school, to express unpopular um, opinions. Well, the Tinker case was the law of the land for virtually 20 years on its own, um, defining for schools at the secondary and collegiate level when school officials could censor it. It was a very difficult hurdle for school officials to overcome. Um, in 1988, another case came along. It actually began in 1983 um, when students at a high school in suburban St. Louis, Hazelwood East High School, um, um, prepared uh, a series of stories that you see on the screen here about the challenges teenagers face. And it's shocking how familiar these challenges are and how much the same stories could have been written and published today. But specifically, their school administration, after they had finished stories and when they were sending the paper to the printer, objected specifically to two. One, the lower right-hand corner about divorce's impact on children. The school principal said after the fact that divorce was a, per to a topic that was per se inappropriate for a high school newspaper to be writing about. Um, and the top story, um, pregnancy affects many teens each year. Um, it, w it described the personal accounts of three students who either um, were pregnant at the time or had very recently had a child in high school and sort of what their experience was. Nothing about their sex lives or anything like that, but just sort of how the um, pregnancy and, and having a child had impacted them. The school principal objected to those stories saying they were inappropriate and removed that entire spread from the newspaper. Three students on the staff of the publication contested that punishment and eventually their case got to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and in 1988, what the Supreme Court did was say, we are distinguishing the black armbands that were at issue in the Tinker case from this kind of speech because this was school sponsored. The student newspaper was tied to a class, a high school journalism class. Um, and as a result, the Supreme Court said, we reaffirm Tinker as a bottom line level of 
free expression protection but we, for high school um, students, but we believe that a lesser level of free expression protection um, shall apply in the context of speech that is school sponsored. And what the Supreme Court did is create a new standard. Censorship has to be reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns. In another place, they said, is there a reasonable educational justification for the censorship? A much more subjective standard than the Supreme Court's um, 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 tinker substantial disruption standard. That standard was based on actual facts present in the school. This was much more based on how well the schools could formulate an argument. And as we've seen in the years since, schools have, or courts have been willing to be fairly deferential to school officials in that um, context. Um, um, well, yeah, let me leave it at that and move to our um, panel. You know, I'm going to ask first, um, the, the impact of the Hazelwood decision is really hard to overstate. Um, the, the changes it has made, especially as it relates to the practice of journalism at the high school level and potentially even at the college level has been pretty dramatic. Um, we, we have, uh, as I said, some really amazing panelists here, one of whom, Jonathan Peters, who's an assistant professor at the University of Dayton, um, with Frank Lamonti, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, um, wrote about the impact of Hazelwood on colleges in an article in the Atlantic magazine. And um, Jonathan, let me maybe ask you to relate to the group what the impact has been in the college environment and what some of the threats are. Sure. Yeah, when, when Hazelwood was handed down in 1988, it was unclear from the decision uh, whether it should apply in the post-secondary uh, context. In a frequently cited footnote, uh, Justice White said that, quote, uh, the court need not now decide whether the same degree of deference is appropriate uh, with respect to school-sponsored expressive activities at the college and university level. Uh, at the time, as Frank pointed out, in a, in a different, uh, this was a law review article uh, published earlier this year, First Amendment advocates uh, took comfort that the damage inflicted by the decision uh, would be confined to the primary and secondary level. Uh, after all, the majority opinion rested on two primary uh, justifications. Uh, one was the maturity rationale, and that's the idea that vulnerable student listeners uh, need protection against harmful speech and the second is the disassociation rationale, uh, that schools should be free to disown uh, speech that associates the school with controversial or otherwise offensive uh, speech. Neither of those rationales, uh, thought the First Amendment advocates in 1988, uh, would support upsetting the long-held uh, judicial disfavor for censorship on college campuses. Uh, first, campuses are gathering places for the exchange of individual ideas and theories, uh, so colleges have little need to disassociate themselves uh, from individual speakers. Now, you know, reasonable listeners do not uh, ascribe to the college the views uh, of the individual theorist and the individual speakers. And the doctrine of academic freedom, which has little to no recognition at the K through 12 level, um, it protects the sanctity of the college campus as a place where unconventional speech is not only uh, tolerated, but also encouraged. Um, second, you've got, you know, Hazelwood's level of control is more justifiable in a captive audience setting. Uh, in, in a K through 12 setting where attendance is compulsory and offended listeners may not always be able uh, to avert their eyes or stand up and leave. The interest of the school, the speaker, uh, the listener, they balance out very differently when the audience is uh, made up of adults who are free to leave. So it was on those base, uh, bases, among others, that First Amendment advocates in 1988 uh, took comfort in the idea that Hazelwood would never go to college. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, as Frank points out in this article, that, uh, that faith was misplaced, that comfort was misplaced. Uh, today, four federal circuits, including the Sixth Circuit, uh, in, a, in a 2012 case, have explicitly embraced Hazelwood uh, as the standard by which all student speech, even, uh, even the speech of adult post-secondary students, is to be judged. Uh, only one circuit, the first, has explicitly rejected Hazelwood's application at the college level. Uh, putting aside any points of law, uh, that is bad policy. Uh, ours is a journalism industry in which the production of news is widely dispersed. The traditional media are reinventing themselves every day to remain competitive in the digital world. Uh, the ongoing challenge is to preserve 
uh, independent reporting, while the foundation of newspapers, uh, the source of most of that reporting, continues to erode. Um, and student journalists are playing a more vital role than ever in that process. Uh, Campus-based publications, uh, collaborations with, with professional outlets and students, they're filling gaps created by the demise of some traditional news media. Uh, Arizona State University operates the Cronkite News Service. Uh, Ohio University operates the State House News Bureau, which offers uh, students a paid internship to cover public affairs in Columbus. And nearly every university in the nation, public or private, is home to a student newspaper that covers local and campus affairs, many of which have an impact uh, far beyond their own campus borders. For years, there has been a consensus building uh, that, that journalism programs need to transform themselves into teaching hospitals for news production. So consider three conclusions by major reports in the last few years. Uh, in 2010, there was a report on democracy in the digital age uh, from the Knight Commission on the information needs of communities and democracy, and it concluded that universities needed to enhance their role, quote, as hubs of journalistic activity. A 2011 report on 21st century journalism uh, from the New America Foundation challenged journalism programs to become, quote, anchor institutions involved in the production of community-relevant news. And in a 2011 report on the changing media landscape, the FCC recommended uh, that foundations, quote, fund journalism school residencies uh, for recent grads to manage efforts to produce significant journalism for the community using journalism students to do so. Uh, I would kiss on the mouth the schools that already have done that. Um, you know, that's fantastic. It serves democracy. But there is a major, major problem here. And as college students and journalism programs fill in these gaps and produce more independent reporting on their own, uh, the federal courts are curtailing First Amendment freedoms for students at public institutions. You know, a major collision is not far away, and one of the, one of the drivers is uh, Hazelwood. So as I mentioned to you today, there are four federal circuits, including the six, that have embraced Hazelwood as the standard. Whatever the debatable merits of Hazelwood's application at the K through 12 level, it's unwise and even dangerous to apply that decision at the college level. Uh, we can't afford to live in a society where free speech on college campuses can be limited so easily, not when college students and faculty members are playing an increasing role in meeting the news needs of their communities. Um, at times, fulfilling those needs means candidly covering a range of public issues uh, that might draw the ire of university administrators and benefactors. And unlike news produced by a professional uh, outlet or an independently financed campus outlet, news produced by a school-sponsored outlet is vulnerable to Hazelwood censorship. So. Um, as Mark mentioned, you know, among other things, the case says that schools may censor news articles uh, that, quote, associate the school with any position uh, other than neutrality on matters of political controversy, end quote. That is plainly irreconcilable with watchdog journalism, uh, a necessary ingredient of any informed community. And in addition to that, uh, kind of my final point here is that Students learn most when they make their own editorial decisions, away from the long shadow of a school. Uh, they have to decide for themselves what information to include uh, in their stories, how to edit for clarity, how to resolve ethical conflicts, and they have to take responsibility for each decision that they make. Uh, that journalistic process can be challenging for a lot of students, but uh, it engages them with the corresponding challenge of self-government and with journalism's role in preserving democracy. Uh, if we want college students and journalism programs to be engaged and to continue making significant contributions, uh, then the federal courts really need to stop curtailing their First Amendment freedoms. And I would argue that state legislatures uh, ought to step in and reverse the damage done by, by the circuits that already have moved in that direction. Thank you, Jonathan. You know, Frank, you probably more than anybody else see these situations firsthand. I mean, getting hundreds of calls from um, high school and college journalists each year about the problems they're facing. You know, what, what do, would you add to what Jonathan said? And then tell us about the impact on high schools and high school journalism and high school journalism educators. So, yeah, thanks. A, uh, just to share with you sort of a microcosm of this, um, I teach every year at a um, uh, an event called Columbia Scholastic Press Association. It's one of the elite events where if you're a high school journalist or a journalism teacher, you go and you get intensive training at Columbia University. 
Um, last year, I taught a class, just sort of an introductory fundamental class on open records and public records, good skill for all citizens to have. And as I'm going through, as I normally do with students, you can get copies of uh, the school budget, you can get copies of the safety inspections of bus reports, you can get copies of the uh, uh, health inspections of your school uh, food service. Um, as I stop for questions, little girl's hand goes up in the audience and says, but won't we get in trouble for doing that? <laughs> won't we get in trouble for doing that? And right beneath her on the next row are two high school teachers who are nodding their heads so fiercely that I thought they would fall off their necks <laughs> because they know very well that at least in their school you would get in trouble for doing that. And that's the Hazelwood mentality at work right there. The idea that somehow exercising the fundamental rights and responsibilities of citizenship is a punishable offense by government authorities. That's just such a frightening notion in a democratic society where we're trying to use our education system to prepare young people to be engaged and responsible citizens. Um, just I thought John's introduction was great. Just to add to that, too, because the Sixth Circuit case that uh, ushered in Hazelwood at the college level, the Ward case, is so illustrative of the way that Hazelwood has overflowed the banks of the river today and is starting to engulf speech that no one in 1988 could possibly have thought was Hazelwood speech, right? Uh, Hazelwood, uh, uh, sort of unremarkably at the time, said only that the uh, forum doctrine, right, the doctrine that the Supreme Court recognized in the Perry education case, which says we're going to decide the level of First Amendment protection that applies on government property based on sort of the suitability of that property for expressive purposes, right? That's the Perry forum doctrine. Hazelwood just imports the forum doctrine into the public school system, overriding in some cases the Tinker case that Mark showed you. Well, um, Hazelwood was always supposed to be about using a school subsidized medium like a newspaper to get your message across. Instead, it has become, as it was in the Ward case, a default uh, for all speech in the context of school academic programs so that in Ward, a conversation one-on-one -on -one between a student and her professor, just words coming out of her mouth in a private office meeting was deemed to be Hazelwood speech because it was in the context of a school educational activity as opposed to using a school educational vehicle for speech. So it has become unmoored to forum doctrine, has become this little dark cloud that follows you every day and every night as a student wherever you go. And of course, right, uh, in the year 2013, we worry about that cloud following you on the internet as well. We've yet to see a case in which a court has said that the Hazelwood standard applies to speech online when you're outside of school grounds using school time. But do not mistake that school and college attorneys are interested in advancing uh, uh, that theory. That, uh, that theory was advanced unsuccessfully in a case called the Tatro case last year in front of the Minnesota Supreme Court in which a college, University of Minnesota, tried to say that they have the Hazelwood level of control over what a college student publishes on her personal Facebook page. They won that case, but not on Hazelwood grounds. Uh, uh, so, so it was uh, rejected in that case. But make no mistake that that's the direction in which the law is being pressed to go. Um, I just want to uh, 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 talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the impact that we've seen on Hazelwood on the climate and the learning environment in high schools. Um, the Student Press Law Center and our friends at Kent State did a survey last year at the National High School Journalism Convention where we surveyed the attendees at this convention. And these are the have programs in journalism. These are the successful ones, the award-winning <laughs> ones, the people with enough support to go to a National High School Journalism Convention. 42% of the attendees there, students and teachers alike, remarkable consistency, said that they had been ordered by a school administrator not to publish something. So four out of 10 said they'd been ordered by a school administrator not to publish something. More worrisome than that, 10% of the teachers said they had had their job taken from them or threatened because of something that their students published, one out of 10. That's the Hazelwood environment, and we don't see very many cases litigated under Hazelwood, certainly not involving high school journalism, and that is why, because people have figured out that they're playing against a casino with loaded dice. The deference is so great under Hazelwood that it is almost impossible, even for a very well-founded censorship complaint, to prevail these days, and the students and the teachers have internalized that, and they know it. Um, this. Um, the quote that John gave you, which is, is really kind of the, the heart and soul of the Hazelwood case, this idea that speech may be censored if it associates the school with a position other than neutrality on a matter of political controversy. I just want you to think about that for a second, because although the forum doctrine being imported into high schools was maybe not a dramatic sea change in our law, the idea that the government 
has an interest in protecting its own image, right? That protecting the image and the impression of the government against its own citizens is an interest of constitutional dimension. And not only constitutional dimension, but important enough to actually override fundamental constitutional freedoms. That is a profound, profound inversion of constitutional principles. It really is a sea change in the way that we look at the law. And why should we care about this, those of us who are not planning to go back to high school anytime soon, right? Um, I mean, just, just two things. Um, um, first, right, uh, the, um, the fact of the matter is uh, uh, the uh, statistics show that about 16,500 professional full-time newsroom jobs have been lost since the year 2007. Um, last year, the, uh, excuse me, last week, National Press Club had a, uh, a lunch, one of these uh, lunches you've all seen on C-SPAN for uh, Arnie Duncan, the Secretary of Education. Um, normally, those lunches sell 150 tickets and uh, pack the room. The Arnie Duncan lunch, they gave the tickets away for free and they couldn't get 30 people. That's the state of education journalism in America today. There is not. There is no coverage of education in America today. The Brookings Institution in 2009 did a study of uh, education journalism in America. They found that 1.4% of all of the news space and news time on major news outlets, online, print, and broadcast, 1.4% was given over to education, almost all of which was disaster-driven uh, epidemics and shootings, and almost none of which was edu education policy related. So who is going to tell us if our schools are not working well anymore, not the 16,500 people who okay. don't have jobs anymore. Well, maybe the school employees will tell us, oh, not so fast. The Supreme Court told us this even closer, told sorry. us in the Garcetti case, right, that school employees no longer have constitutional protection for whistleblowing if the speech grows out of their performance of their own employment duties. The professional news media cannot tell us. The employees cannot tell us. Who is left to tell us if our schools are not functioning, if the bathrooms are dirty, if the sex ed programs are ineffective? The only people left are our embedded journalists, and that is the students. That's why they've got to have some freedom from censorship. The other point is um, we're all rightly concerned about the effectiveness of civic education in America today, but I just can't think of any greater prescription for <coughs> civic disengagement than to tell young people that you cannot fight City Hall. And I will tell you that that is the message from which they are coming away from public education, that we don't even question the government anymore, let alone take it to court. And if we're going to effectively teach participation as a citizen, we're going to have to recalibrate and bring back the reasonable balance that we had in the Tinker case. Frank, um, I, if let me interrupt just a second and tell all the panelists, please talk directly into the mics because apparently they don't pick up very far away at all. You know, and, and the other thing, Frank, I'd like you to specifically talk about some of the, the, the workarounds to the Hazelwood implications to the public forum yeah. question and the um, um, and the state legislation, if you could. Too. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, um, just to, to finish that that thought on a hopeful note, I like to be hopeful. Um, so the, uh, the the journalism education community, both those who teach at high school and those who teach at college, have come together on this 25th anniversary and have each adopted resolutions. The AEJMC, that is the umbrella organization of the college teaching of journalism. The JEA, the umbrella organization of the high school teaching of journalism, have each adopted resolutions saying that the Hazelwood Standard, I'm just going to read you this passage, the Hazelwood Standard says schools may censor if they could point to a legitimate pedagogical justification. That is the formulation in, in, in the, the case. Each of them has said there, no legitimate pedagogical purpose is served by the censorship of student journalism, even if it reflects unflatteringly on school policies and programs, candidly discusses sensitive social and political issues, or voices opinions challenging to majority views on matters of public concern. Now, I will tell you that you are going to see that line in many briefs to come because the Supreme Court right, has said legitimate pedagogical purpose is the trigger point for censorship. If all of the people who know journalism journalism education best have said there is no legitimate pedagogical purpose to the censorship of uh, controversial political issues being discussed in schools, that's a powerful message to our courts to which they should defer. Um, so two points on, on, on working around Hazelwood. The Supreme Court recognized in Hazelwood that it was possible to designate publications as a public forum for student expression. And if a publication were so designated, then it would be entitled to that heightened tinker level of protection and not the 
uh, uh, level of protection in Hazelwood, um, um, which, to be clear, is not an anything goes standard. It is not published Penthouse Magazine. It is still a balanced standard which recognizes that the school can step in if the speech is unlawful or if it encourages disruption of school activities or it encourages people to break the law. Um, it, it, while it is theoretically possible to be a public forum for student expression, we don't know exactly what that means. Uh, uh, there was a, a case in the Eastern District of Ohio 10 years ago. Shall I go into the drought case You now? can mention it, yeah, drought. and Northern District of Ohio. Me, Northern the, District yeah. of Ohio, the drought versus Wooster case, this is 10 years ago, judge in the Northern District examined a high school publication in one of those rare post-Hazelwood censorship lawsuits and looked at what would be the factors that would go into making a publication qualify as a public forum. It was a very careful analysis looking at, well, what is the policy on paper? What is the practice on the ground? Has the teacher been actively involved in making assignments and in reading the copy? Has the principal been involved in reviewing and changing the copy? Are, does it look more like a class, or does it look more like a student-driven, expressive activity? Now, in that case, interestingly, um, the uh, court did conclude that the high school newspaper was a limited public forum, but ratified the censorship anyway, refused to issue an injunction in joining the censorship, finding that because the copy uh, was potentially libelous, potentially defamatory, the school, in fact, even under the heightened Tinker standard, had legal grounds to order it withheld. And so uh, uh, the public forum status, again, is not an anything goes, do anything you want standard. It gives the school really all the authority it needs to censor for legitimate purposes. Um, the other way that one can get around the Hazelwood standard is by state legislation, right? The states can always give you more constitutional rights than the, than the First Amendment. It is a floor and not a ceiling. And seven states have elected to do so, including in this region Iowa has. Um, interestingly, we now have over 160 years of combined experience with what are called anti-Hazelwood statutes, if you look around the country. And so that 160 years of combined experience gives us quite the laboratory to look at whether some of the horribles that were predicted by school attorneys at the time these statutes were, were, were enacted have really come to pass. And the answer is there's no evidence of that. There's absolutely no evidence that school, uh, school children in Iowa or Kansas or any of the other places with anti-Hazelwood statutes are running them up with their freedoms and libeling people or uh, tying their principles up in court all day long. Uh, with the exception of one lawsuit in California, we can't find any evidence that anyone has ever taken a school to court in the 160 years of experience with these anti-Hazelwood statutes because what they do is resolve disputes and not cause them because once you have an anti-Hazelwood statute with a laundry list of the exclusive permissible bases for censorship, it makes everyone's rights and responsibilities clear. Frank, thank you. Uh, I have a follow-up question that we'll come back to when we're done with the rest of the panel. You know, the, as Jonathan and Frank, I think, make clear, the challenges the Hazelwood decision have posed for high school and college students, and specifically student media, are pretty significant. But those are not the only challenges they face. And we have two other panelists, I think, that um, can describe a, a, a different kind of battle um, in uh, on, involving, um, you know, press freedom, access, information on college and university campuses, specifically relating to information about campus crime and information about athletics, which frequently are very closely tied together, surprisingly. <laughs> our, our next po uh, panelist, Hillary Warren, is an associate professor at Otterbein University, and her students have been, uh, let me emphasize this, not Hillary, her students have been very involved in um, an ongoing um, disagreement with her university over access to information about crime. Hillary, tell us about that. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, at Otterbein University, about two and a half years ago, the university converted from a security force to a police force, which meant that incidents on campus that rose beyond a certain level that, you know, uh, cheating dorm kinds of things, um, would end up being, instead of being kicked over to the Westerville Police, campus police were handling those themselves. They had full arrest powers. They were commissioned. They were fully commissioned Ohio um, officers. When they went through that conversion, they determined that despite the fact that they were fully commissioned police officers as part of their location within a private university, that they were also exempt from Ohio public records law. And so what that meant is that crime that had happened on campus that students could then go and get a report from Westerville Police, they were no longer able to get that report. They could see that something had happened because it was on the Cleary log. They could see that potentially there had been a case of um, 
drug abuse, of, of finding something in a dorm room or something being found on campus property, um, or that there had potentially been a sexual assault. But beyond that, there was no information available, no information about um, what had happened to that case, uh, who the perpetrator was, how that had been ultimately adjudicated. The students um, have been requesting this information, like I said, for about two and a half years going through a number of different um, uh, avenues to do so. But this, I think, points out a key issue is that we have more private universities who are converting their security forces to police forces. This is in part in response to campus shootings and potentially in part a, 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 an effort to try to control the information. Um, Again, the police are denying access, claiming that they are exempt from Ohio Public Records Law, that because their funding is coming from a private institution, despite the fact the private institution is getting funded through federal dollars, that somehow those records are exempt. The university argues that this is to protect student privacy and that this is to protect the student who might not want to come forward and to allow the campus to use the campus judicial system as a way of resolving these conflicts. And so what we're seeing now, and, and not just at Otterbein, but at other schools around the country and other schools in Ohio, is that sexual assault cases that perhaps would have gone through the regular criminal justice system are instead being referred to campus judicial, being referred to committees of students and faculty to somehow adjudicate these issues. Um, However, going further, um, recently at Otterbein, the police are now also refusing to release a report of an incident of sexual imposition by a faculty member. Um, and so the students have been unable to get information about this particular case, unable to get information about that police record. And so it seems um, extraordinary, honestly, that in, in, you know, as Jonathan Peters saying, potentially bad policy to say that you can create a campus police force that is not simply um, managing these cases but can use their arrest powers while still claiming an exemption from Ohio Public Records Law. Thank you, Hillary. You know, that very closely relates to experiences that I know our next panelist, uh, Jill Riepenhoff, has had both in trying to cover as a professional journalist and off-campus journalist, cover campus crime and also covering athletics. And, and Jill, you have experience both with both areas. And if you tell us a little bit about that. And I know specifically we're going to talk about the federal privacy, education records privacy law that has been used as the um, excuse for why so many schools um, refuse to provide information. <coughs> There is no law that I hate more than FERPA. <laughs> and Hillary, you know, you're not alone. We have those same issues at Ohio State, which is a public <laughs> police force. Um, I'm just going to use, you know, go through a couple really quick examples here. Um, I'm not as well versed in campus crime as I am in other aspects of how FERPA is used to hide. Um, but there was there was three um, rapes at Ohio State last fall in a dorm and the student newspaper, The Lantern, found out about it months and months and months later. And they tried to find out what happened to the uh, accused. Um, and they wouldn't tell them what happened to these, these people. We don't even know if the, the accused were students or someone off the street or a kid from OU or whatever. We have no clue. And they refused, saying FERPA. Um, um, a few years ago, somebody in a student from Denison filed a civil action in Licking County Common Pleas Court relating to a sexual assault that happened to this student on campus. And the Licking County prosecutor found out about this and said, why am I just now finding out that there was a sexual assault on my campus? Um, you know, on this campus, and he laid down basically a riot act with Denison and said, I want to know every time there is an allegation of a sexual assault on that campus. This past year, Denison hired um, a private ambulance service to work on campus on the weekends, um, saying that it didn't want to tax the, uh, the Granville Fire Department anymore, but, you know, really the reason is so that they can, they can hide, you know, drunk kids passing out and getting into trouble or whatever. Um, so they, you know, even at the, the public schools, they don't know what they're doing either. Um, 
you guys may or may not know this name, recognize it. Um, guy by the name of Terrell Pryor. He was, <laughs> he was a quarterback at, at Ohio State. Um, and he liked cars, especially those that didn't belong to him and belonged to car dealerships. And we spent a lot of time tracking down what vehicles he was driving. And he had a, there was some incident, and forgive me my memory, I think I'm starting Alzheimer's. I can't remember exactly what the incident was, but, but there was something um, involving a police report. And we got the police report, incident report, from Ohio State Police, and they had redacted Terrell Pryor's name. And Randy, Randy Ludlow and I were both on the phone within two seconds, absolutely screaming our heads off at them because a police incident report is not protected by FERPA, not zero zilch. So with, with the Terrell Pryor, you know, I'll use that as a, as a segue into kind of the, the next thing. My experience with FERPA really has um, largely surrounded at college athletics. Um, Ohio State has been in trouble a time or two with some, some players, Maurice Claret, you know. It's been a long, a long battle trying to kind of get to the bottom of, of wrongdoing. And several years ago, I did basically like a public records audit, if you will, of Division I schools around the country and asked for pretty benign um, documents from them relating to athletics, like flight manifests when they fly to the, the football games and their summer jobs, um, which for football teams are almost all exclusively arranged by the coaches. Um, and what cars they're driving, their car registration forms, there were some other things. But basically what I found out is that that FERPA is all over the board. Some people will claim FERPA that these are protected and they're not. And it's like, there's no real clear definition of what an education record is. And that's what FERPA is supposed to protect. So I called the guy who, who crafted FERPA, Buckley, and I talked to him. And he, you know, basically when he kind of heard the results of, our, of my survey, basically said, the universities have bastardized this law. It's supposed to protect, protect academic records. That's all, you know, that makes sense to all of us, but seeing what car somebody's driving or what job they're working in the summer that has nothing to do with their, with their degree or anything like that um, is really crazy. So they, you know, Ohio State in particular takes it to the nth degree. Um, <laughs> Last year, uh, our basketball beat writer, Bob Baptist, had always, every single year, gotten from um, the basketball program um, how high the basketball players mm -hmm. jump and what their wingspan is and all this kind of, you know, just stuff about, about their athletic abilities. And he would, it's not like he would write a story about it, but if it, you know, came to, you know, came to be an important part of a story, like, you know, some, so and so's long arms were able to, you know, bat down the, the game winning shot or whatever. And uh, Ohio State denied giving it to him under FERPA. Thank you, Jill. We, you know, we, we've seen FERPA especially come up uh, in, in the course of the last couple years here in Ohio, relating to Ohio State. and, and our next panelist, Jack Grenier, is directly involved in, in one of these battles um, involving, again, not a student media organization, but a commercial news organization, ESPN. Jack, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mark. I practiced law since 1983, and in 2011, I finally did something that made my two sons think that I did something worthwhile. <laughs> When I got retained by ESPN to bring a public records case against Ohio State University, we're a Notre Dame family, so the idea of suing the Ohio State was, was perfectly acceptable to my sons, who ironically enough happened to be a law student at Ohio State at the time. Uh, but I digress. Um, the, uh, the case involved uh, that, that Terrell Pryor guy that uh, was mentioned earlier and a few other folks and the tattoo parlor situation, and the, the issue was um, whether Ohio State would give to ESPN various records, including things like emails from uh, Jim Tressel with a local uh, Columbus businessman who, I, I apologize, escapes my, you guys probably know it better than I do, but uh, 
And Ohio State pretty much threw a blanket over everything claiming FERPA protection. And, and I'll, I'll probably overlap a little bit with Jill said, but I think that what I discovered in, in working on the case was that, you know, FERPA, whether you want to say it was bastardized or um, expanded beyond all recognition, uh, but, I, but, you know, here's what it says, okay? It says, no funds, th th there shall be no federal funds made available to an institution which has a policy or practice of permitting the release of education records. That's a little bit of a condensed version, but that's, that's pretty much accurate. Now, uh, the thing is, what Ohio State said was, they, they, they technically didn't say, well, they did. Under the, the Public Records Act, the Ohio Public Records Act, 149.43, they said, we can't give you these records because they are, the, the, the production of these records is prohibited by a state or federal law, that federal law being FERPA. FERPA doesn't, by its terms, prohibit the release of any records. It just says that if you have a policy or practice of releasing education records, you lose your federal funding. A federal court in Illinois agreed with that position that it doesn't prohibit anything, and so a state law, uh, a public records law that says that um, they don't have to produce records, the release of which are prohibited, the FERPA wasn't a law that prohibited release. That case went up to the Seventh Circuit, and it got set aside, but only on, on uh, basically jurisdictional procedural grounds, the Seventh Circuit saying that it didn't raise a federal question. But, and I thought that would be a pretty decent argument with the Ohio Supreme Court. But I think I discovered that, that I, you know, Ohio State had the ultimate home court advantage, uh, a, a case, you know, with elected judges in Columbus. Um, that sounds a little bitter and petty, but um, <laughs> be that as it may. Uh, but I made that argument, and the court basically said, uh, no, if, they, if, if, the, if the feds can um, withhold funding, that is, for all intents and purposes, prohibition. I also said, yeah, but it says practice or policy. And how is it that sporadic public records requests constitutes a practice or policy? I mean, it doesn't. This is a, this, you know, this is a request by ESPN. ESPN hasn't made a request for a, a while, at least, and may not again. So how does that translate into a practice or policy? And the Supreme Court said it just kind of does. <laughs> um, and then the question, you know, became, well, again, how is an investigation by a private body, the NCAA is, is private, okay? It's not a state actor. And how is it that that is an education record? And again, unfortunately, I think the Ohio Supreme Court, in a case involving Miami University several years ago, uh, it, I think, got it right when it said, you know, disciplinary records, and I think these, the particular records in that case, the, the Miami student paper, which is called Miami student, um, asked for some disciplinary records that had to do with some uh, fraternity activities of students, and the court said, yeah, that's not an education record, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with academics. It's not. Um, and, and all that was well and good, except then Miami uh, found itself in a federal litigation brought by the Department of Education, and the Sixth Circuit said, yeah, those are education records. Um, so I think the Ohio Supreme Court was a little um, uh, beaten down by that, by the, the Miami University experience, and so it, it fairly easily, unfortunately, found that these, these are education records. I mean, the ultimate irony and, and maybe arguably hypocrisy of this thing is that if you go to Ohio State's website and you go to their football page, you know, what do they list, among other things, about their football players? They're GPAs. <laughs> I mean, so, so like the information that's supposed to be covered by FERPA is available to anybody who wants to look at their website. The stuff that is not supposed to be covered by FERPA, you can't touch, you know, with a ten-foot pole. So, um, it's a little, it's a little frustrating. But that, that's the state of affairs. Can I add one thing to that? Sure. 
The other thing that's kind of interesting that every single, it is a requirement if you are going to play Division I athletics, every single athlete from the quarterback to the gymnast, everyone has to waive their FERPA rights. They sign a document waiving their FERPA rights. Thank you, Joe. I, I think an instructive point out to credit you, even though you lost the overarching decision in an in-camera review of the documents in question, the Supreme Court did find that Ohio State illegally withheld a group of records inciting FERPA. Right, they did. And they also found, uh, Randy just pointed out that despite my overall loss, there was a small margin of victory, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> they told us to repeat the questions. Uh, but uh, there was a, uh, and also that the Ohio State technically violated the, the uh, Public Records Act by their initial response, which was they did not cite any applicable law. They just basically said, we're not going to give it to you. So um, there is a requirement that if the public body denies the request, they have to give you the, the legal citation uh, for that. So there, there, were, there were a couple of small, small victories in there. Thank you. You know, I want to open it up for questions. We don't have a lot of time left, but what, what would you like to ask of any of our panelists about what they've described or things they've only alluded to? Yes. I'd like to ask Mr. Greiner, Tactically, if it was a mistake for ESPN to take this case by itself without being joined by any of the state media for some of the reasons that you outlined. You know, the question was whether it was a mistake for ESPN to have brought this case without the support of other state media. I don't think it would have mattered, honestly. I mean, I, I think it, it, it certainly wouldn't have hurt, but I, I don't think, given the, the rationale in the court's opinion, I. I don't honestly think it would have it would have made a whole lot of difference. As I say, I, I do think that the the Miami University experience uh, made the Supreme Court, I think, a little hesitant to to go out there again and be sort of slapped down by the by the feds. Yes. Question for Joe. Since your uh, series on FERPA, I think there was one of your one of your sidebars was that. Congress is going to take a, a revisit the law and maybe uh, you know, do some modification or revamping. Has there been any, has that been lost? Is it put on a shelf, get it dust, or what? Just to restate the question, has Congress made any effort to revisit the law as w had been discussed at some points? No. <laughs> yeah, that I, I, it's really, really tough to get them interested in a, in a grand way on this topic. and. Um, I guess we need some kids dying for this to happen. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, that already has <laughs> happened. The most effective response or prompt to changes in FERPA have been crime victims, actually. You know, the, there was, once upon a time, the uh, FERPA was held to apply to campus police records explicitly, and as a result of a lawsuit that the Student Press Law Center brought, um, um, eventually the National crime victims group um, persuaded Congress to amend the law to exclude law enforcement unit records from that. Other questions? Who else? Yeah, at the back. Frank, could you speak at all to um, the successes and failures of bringing in uh, private police forces at, at universities under public records law in other states? Yeah, thank you, great question. Thanks. The question was, how about coverage of private uh, police forces by state records in, in other states. We've actually had a little breakthrough in that this year. There was a case called uh, uh, the uh, Oxner versus uh, Elon University case involving a, uh, a, a, a college broadcaster who wanted uh, crime records from his private college police department in North Carolina. It got to the North Carolina Supreme Court, which remarkably ended in a 4-4 tie because of a recusal. But as a result of that case, the North Carolina legislature enacted a statute this year which says that uh, private police forces in the state of North Carolina, if they have full arrest arrest powers set on the same footing with all other public agencies and must disclose to the same extent. Now North Carolina and Georgia have that explicitly in their statutes. There is some uh, a 
more limited disclosure uh, entitlement in California law and in Virginia law. Um, in the courts, the, the uh, cases have really been uh, a few and, and uh, not resulted in any unanimous authority. There was one against Harvard University that failed several years ago where it was held that the Harvard police were not on the same footing with uh, state and city police and therefore did not have to disclose. But certainly, I think any place in America where you have got police who have the authority to use deadly force and make arrests, the idea that they literally do not have to tell you who they arrested and for what just seems so foundationally un-American that this is something that, that legislatures have got to change. Other questions? Yes. Anybody who can answer. If, say, a sophomore, junior, senior student at a college uh, is aware of the that institution, soft peddling, alleged crimes, is raped and chooses to not call the police, complete an affidavit, file that affidavit with the prosecuting attorney, the county sheriff, and then let them go forward so they can remain outside the internal so-called policing entity of the institution. Can they get by with that? You know, uh, try to summarize, to, uh, is, is it a realistic option to, you know, have, for students to encourage students to go outside of campus to report the offenses as a way of avoiding this problem with the campuses covering it up? Anybody have a no, response? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it probably not quite directly responsive response, but you, you, you touched on something really important, which is that today, um, the statistics that people get, uh, Hillary mentioned the Cleary Act, that is the federal crime disclosure law. Uh, the statistics that people get on campus sexual assaults are not worth the paper they are printed on. Those, those numbers are, are, are systematically underreported. There are large public universities, including several I've attended, where there are 30 and 40,000 people on campus, and they will swear to you that they've had two rapes on a campus of 30 and 40,000 people. That's a, an inherent flaw in the disclosure system, and part of the reason is that people who are raped on campus invariably are encouraged to take it to a secretive student conduct board rather than to go to the police. They are steered into a closed door, opaque student conduct process process from which uh, journalists can get zero information. Um, Congress did amend FERPA in one of the few forward progress moves uh, to say that the outcomes of those processes when a violent crime or a sex crime is found to have occurred are no longer covered by FERPA. I will tell you, we've just completed a nationwide public records audit on this. I'll give you the preview of the findings. No one knows that's the law. No <laughs> institutions are conducting themselves as if they must release that information. They are all continuing almost unanimously to still withhold it. You know, I think we're out of time. Let me mention two things. First of all, um, well, actually, I'll save that for last. Um, Frank came the longest distance to get here from Washington, D.C., um, Northern Virginia. Um, there are some materials about the Student Press Law Center out there, um, and including, especially for those of you who are active reporters doing this or college journalists, a book called Covering Campus Crime that the Student Press Law Center produced with the support of the Society of Professional Journalists that describes a lot of this in very explicit detail. It's a great resource. Um, let's thank our panelists for all of <laughs>